Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Vlad Grigorescu, um, and uh, I'm excited to be here today. Welcome to Zeek Week. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a project I've been working on. Um, it's a web interface and an API for changing your settings on your Zeek clusters on the fly. And it goes out and it uh, realizes those changes instantly with no restart needed, and it can scale up to a large number of clusters. Uh, it's a project I'm calling Easy Configurator. Um, so this is something that kind of arose out of some specific pain points that my team was experiencing. So I'm going to go through some of the um, motivation for that uh, to kind of lay out a framework for um, what this is trying to solve. Uh, I'll be doing a demo, um, go into some of the design and overall architecture, um, and then talk about some of the um, future work that uh, I'm planning to do with it, um, and how to spin it up yourselves, and uh, some time for questions at the end. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a Zeek user. I think I got bitten by the bro bug several years ago and have been deploying bro Zeek uh, ever since and generally hacking away at it. Um, I'm uh, part of the core development team. I've done a lot of work on specifically protocol analyzers and file analyzers and expanding Zeek's capabilities in that regard. Um, so if you have a bug in the SSH or Kerberos analyzer, then come track me down after this, and I'll try to apologize for it. Um, most recently, I'm a security engineer at ESNet. And a lot of people aren't familiar with ESNet. Um, we are a, uh, the, our main role is to connect all the Department of Energy National Labs together, as well as a few other strategic um, partnerships. And the, our uh, goal here is to uh, enable a lot of the science. Um, so over the past few decades, there's been a transformation in how science gets done. Uh, similar to how computing has been moving up into the cloud, that when you spin up some compute resources in the cloud, you don't care about where those resources are physically located, uh, assuming that the network has a low enough latency and high enough bandwidth for you to get the data that you need. And in a similar way, there are these very large scientific instruments that are being built in a few central locations, and the researchers are just accessing the data remotely from their telescope, uh, light source, um, particle accelerator uh, and actually processing the data on some supercomputers and then storing it in some big data lake. Um, and our role here is to be that low latency, high speed network that uh, enables the science to get done. And we're also this blend of kind of this cutting edge research network with uh, more of a traditional ISP where uh, many of these labs have thousands of users, and for some of these, we're their only connection to the internet, uh, including for our bosses at DOE. Um, so there's a lot of, there's kind of a balance that we're trying to walk between being, um, uh, supporting the, the research and then um, providing good service to uh, our actual customers. Some of the challenges that goes on with this is the fact that um, the sheer amount of data that's going across the network is uh, difficult to deal with. Um, and to, I guess, put this into numbers, we have over 950 100 gigabit ports in use on our network on the routers. Um, I think uh, in September, we saw a bit over uh, three petabytes of traffic per day coming into our network. And of course, that gets bounced around, so we, end, we could potentially end up seeing it many more times. And looking back over the past 30 years, almost like clockwork, we've seen a order of magnitude growth in the traffic volume every 47 months, which is far faster than the rate that the internet has been accelerating. Um, this has some real implications as we're buying and sizing new Zeke clusters, and that we know that whatever hardware we're buying today, uh, it'll still need to be operational for 10 times that amount of traffic. Um, we also have gear in over 400 locations in the US and Europe, uh, most of which we can't easily get to, and our contract with the federal government requires at least five nines of uptime. 
but it's fine. There's a security team of five people. Uh, we, we've got this. Uh, but joking aside, there's a, a really good team, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of us are OG Bro users, and Zeek is kind of our tool of choice in tackling this. Um, this kind of shows our Zeek clusters. The purple ones are going to be spun up in the next two to six months, um, and I think we're going to have about 56 clusters uh, in total. Um, and a big issue, or a big uh, problem we were running into is just kind of keeping these in sync. So we kind of went the traditional approach. We uh, applied some automation and configuration management. Um, we even went a step further doing continuous integration testing. And so um, we could pull down new versions of Zeek Master, build an RPM, make sure that all of our scripts still worked against it, deploy it to a bare metal system, make sure that it still works with our network driver. Um, and do all that good stuff, and kind of vice versa as well. Whenever we made a change to a script, uh, we could go out and test it against the version of Zeek and make sure that the change didn't break anything. The problem we're running into, though, is that the more process we add around this, the less flexible we are and the harder it is to react and actually tweak some of those settings. So if I want to go and I want to whitelist an IP address from a notice, that means I need to pull down the Git repo, check out a branch, push out my changes, uh, wait for the continuous integration testing to run, file a merge request, wait for that to get approved. And this is a pretty slow process. And what we were discovering was that we were not enabling notices because we were afraid of the tuning work that needed to happen, or we were looking at doing the tuning after Zeek had already, saw, had already seen it in Splunk or some kind of sword tool. Um, and, and that kind of seemed like a waste. The other realization was that a lot of our policies and scripts, um, a, a lot of the custom scripts that we wrote, uh, the detection can be pretty straightforward. So in this case, um, we're looking at an HTTP request, and we have a, a pattern, a regular expression of URLs that we consider malicious. And if there's a match, then we generate a notice. So the logic on this is pretty straightforward. But what the script actually looks, ends up looking like is something like this. And part of the issue is that I'm now missing all the context around that. I don't know why this is bad. Why it, is it still bad? Or, um, and in the specific example, over two thirds of the actual script was really just trying to encode that this is malicious behavior. Um, you know, this is something traditionally suited for the intelligence framework, but it doesn't really support patterns right now. With some new features in Zeek 3.0, it probably could. Um, but it, at, at this point, you know, I, I might as well do this in Suricata, and then I could have signature or could have metadata associated with each uh, particular signature. And not to denigrate Suricata, but Suricon's in a few weeks. This is Zeek week, so there, there, there needs to be a better solution in the Zeek world for this. The other thing that we were running into was a lot of the other kind of logic that we were encoding in the scripts was how to handle notices and how to do exemptions. So again, here we kind of thought that we were doing the right thing and that we defined some variables and we make sure to add things to our neighbor um, networks and we check to see uh, whether this is a neighbor that we know about or a local address. And if it's not, we have a whitelist for this remote desktop traffic. And if the originator and host and the responder uh, match an entry in that whitelist, then we can um, also check some kind of uh, overall uh, networks that we expect to see this traffic from. And if all that logic checks out, we go and we um, generate a, an alert for it. All right. Um, so this is our uh, East Coast instance of Easy Configurator. And let me see if I can exit out of full screen. All right, so let's go and configure San Jose. Um, so these are uh, six of our uh, production clusters that we have connected to it right now. And um, so out of the box, when you install the Zeek package, it 
goes out and it lists all the variables in your setup that are options. And those are things that in Zeek, you can tune those on the fly. You don't need to redef and restart. They're just, a bit, they're just there. Um, and it will go out and identify all those and kind of send its current state of uh, everything out to the server. And it also goes out and it pulls the documentation for that. So those are those kind of weird double pound sign comments that you see above those fields. Zeek uh, kind of turns those into documentation that you can work with. Um, so as you're writing custom scripts, make sure you're adding that documentation and you get to see it in this interface automatically. Um, it also ties in with the uh, Zeek user manual. So it knows what an interval is and it, it will take you to the documentation on that data type if you need a refresher about what exactly this data type is and what you want to do with it. And it knows that an interval refers to a number of seconds. So let's say that we wanted to go ahead and change this from 90 to 900 and our summary of our change is too many requests are timing out. And then if you see in the background here, that change has already been pushed out to San Jose. Um, this is the Zeek config log, and I know this might be hard to read in the back, but it's showing us that at this time, this variable was changed from 90 to 900. And maybe I want to go ahead and change it back because that caused our memory load to spike. Um, that change is now pushed out there. Um, and part of what you get with this is auditing and uh, kind of accounting. So that similar to pushing things out through a Git repo, I can see exactly who made a change and why and when. Um, there was also support for more complicated data types. So um, this analyzer and activity timeout is a table of enums of intervals and I can go ahead and I can change those on there. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm seeing SSH connections that are up to one day. And you can see that that's been pushed out. Um, So kind of revisiting the previous example, um, in Zeek, the pattern kind of gets uh, created as a single entity, but there was the realization that um, a lot of those patterns, the way people are actually setting them, um, they end up being a bunch of separate patterns ORed together. Um, so even though this is a single data type behind the scenes, um, easy configure will split this up into individual items um, and then you can go and you can uh, modify individual ones and then on the back end it does a whole bunch of manipulations to turn that into a format that Zeek is actually expecting. Um, there's also an overall activity stream so I can get a sense of we really saw some performance issues. I'm curious what changes happened or just to, um, again, for the accountability. Um, okay. So the idea is that you can quickly push out these changes to any number of clusters. Um, there is some early support for defining groups of clusters. So. Um, you know, maybe these are my data center clusters, maybe these are out on the WAN, and whenever you make a change, it's gonna push that out everywhere. Um, there's some additional work I wanna do to make sure to, um, make sure that any changes you push out are safe to do so, that the, all the, the systems actually currently have the same value or the same data type, or that they even have the same variable. Um, and you can use this to uh, set any type of option, any, type any variable that can be defined as an option. Um, so that's um, pretty much everything that you work with uh, in your day-to-day -day scripts. Uh, you have the change tracking and the auditing, and part of the goal of this is to start documenting some of those magic values of what is this pattern and where did it come from, or 
4096 means 4K, or, and, and there are some data types that um, kind of have an additional field of you can kind of explain what this thing is, so when someone else is looking at it, they get a sense of uh, what you were doing. Um, we've tied this into a couple of applications. Uh, so the first one is a uh, notice policy configuration package. Actually, I can probably pull that up here quickly. Um, I remember which server actually has that installed. Um, and, and this is a Zeek package to uh, give you a couple of fundamental ways to configure which notices you want to act on and what you want to do with those notices. So um, it exposes some of these options in terms of um, a couple of sets and Stop, what did you call this thing? I feel like I'm spending too much time on this. Um, so that is a package that we'll be releasing. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, I released a Zeek exporter package where you add that to your cluster, and then you can scrape a, a ton of performance data and other information from uh, Prometheus, so you can see which events are being called, which functions are being called everywhere, and how long the process is taking inside of each of those. Um, so one of the things you can do is this will interact with that in that um, you can start annotating, I changed this variable here, and you can tie it to a specific change ID, and then you can see what impact that actually had of, yeah, I wanted to turn on this additional analysis or modify this inactivity timeout, and you can see that really caused a jump in uh, the CPU time that these processes were taking or whatever. Um, there's a couple other packages that we're kind of kicking around internally. Um, there's a, one for log filtering where, similar to the notice exemption, uh, notice policy configuration, you just um, can define some fields of, you know, if the connection is state S0, so that's something where we only saw a SIN scan, I want you to log that to a separate file. Um, we're doing some of that logic already, but it's kind of convoluted, and we have multiple scripts that are stepping on each other, and we really want that to be dynamic and flexible and quick. Um, even to the point that if you have a, a sudden burst of traffic from some noisy host, maybe you just send that off to a separate log for until, it, uh, until that event goes away. Um, sometimes just exempting things in a notice isn't enough, that with some of the uh, aggregate uh, notice types, so like scan detection, where you're looking at each individual connection, uh, maybe you have a honeypot and you don't care about who scans that and you don't want that to be counted towards the overall badness of the thing. So a package that kind of um, lets you configure uh, how exactly you're counting the observations that you're counting. Um, so on the back end, what's happening is uh, there's one or more web servers, and there's a little Python process, which I'm calling broker D, and the name of that uh, Python process is to, uh, it speaks the broker protocol to and from your manager. The manager is the only part of your cluster that's actually doing anything here. Um, and then it translates those uh, broker messages into JSON and uh, then sends it up to the web server. Um, 
there's also a, uh, you can spin up a persistent store on the cluster. Uh, this is something that broker supports out of the box. And the idea here is that if your web server goes away and your cluster restarts, you want some way to persist those values. Um, and this is one of those things of, it was designed kind of from the beginning so that you could have multiple web servers and it could have some graceful failover and redundancy. And then on my flight over, this happened yesterday. So uh, what you saw before was actually our failover instance. And I got to test that uh, as our main instance has been powered off. All right. Um, so stuff that we really want to do uh, in the future. So one of the big ones is an ex the idea of expiration. So I want to put this exemption in for an hour, a week, a year, whatever, um, and then after that time have that automatically go away. Um, you could do that already with the API. Um, I'm trying to find a more elegant solution where you're not running something periodically to pull out the expired variables. Um, a cool feature that this kind of opens the door to is the idea of some kind of role-based access control to where before maybe you had to give out permission to your whole cluster to make changes. Maybe you let your SOC just change one or two Zeek variables in there that if they're seeing an event, um, then they can go ahead and they can whitelist that. Or it even opens up the door to some kind of user self-service where if I know I'm gonna be traveling to, let's say, Ukraine, um, and then uh, for a week I have a portal where I can go and I can add that exemption and that would automatically get pushed out to the Z clusters. Um, there's some additional work to be done for uh, type safety. So right now you can set an enum and that may or may not exist uh, on the cluster. The cluster handles that just fine, but it'd be nice to get some uh, feedback that as a user you're trying to set something that doesn't actually exist. And there's some types of uniqueness verifications for sets that it's not detecting. Um, as I mentioned, there is, some, there is support for creating groups of sensors and pushing out changes to multiple sensors, um, but that's uh, really kind of exposed on the, uh, through the back end or API interface. So, um. so what does the install look like? Um, so a lot of work was, so this is a Django web app, but a lot of work was uh, put into making it do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, where it's really a matter of doing a pip install and then starting up the server. Um, really, in any production use case, you're going to spin up a database for this and you're going to probably put um, some kind of uh, proxying or reverse proxying HTTP server in front of it that also handles some authentication. But this is enough to get you up and running. And then on the client, you do a zekage install and then you go ahead and deploy it. And when you do that install, it'll ask you for an option of basically what web server URL am I pointing to. So, what can you do uh, in this ecosystem? The first one is publishing packages. I feel like that's always a good thing, but specifically um, in your packages, think about what should be a redef which is something that gets set when Zeek starts up and then cannot be changed, and what should be an option which is this kind of dynamically changeable thing. Um, for certain types of options, you might need to do something when that value changes, others just kind of magically work. Not everything makes sense to be dynamically configured. Um, you probably don't want to change your log format halfway through writing out a log file or the separator from a tab to a semicolon or something like that. So some thought needs to go into uh, what are the implications of this change and how do I handle it gracefully. Um, try it out. Right now, uh, we are using this in production, but we're kind of treating it as uh, beta a little bit. Um, but I'm curious to see uh, other people's impressions, and again, you know, a lot of this was built to directly address pain points and issues we ran into. So if this is overlooking some kind of workflow that you would like to do, um, then you can file some GitHub issues. So here are some links. Um, uh, these aren't really live yet because of said power outage throwing a bit of a wrench in the works. Uh, but I expect them to be I expect everything to be up uh, later today or maybe tomorrow, and I'll also send an email to the Zeek user mailing list, um, kind of rehashing some of these links. 
So that's all I have. And now if there are any questions. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that idea of sensor groups. Um, so the idea would be that kind of when you make the change, you have a drop down, and you can just say that you can predefine some groups of everything, data center, WAN, whatever, uh, and then it would go out and push those out everywhere. So um, the support for those sensor groups is on the, the, the support is there in the back end. I just need to find a good way of exposing that on the front end and then figuring out how much safety you want around those changes. So um, you know, what happens if you've already overridden that value on one particular host, which one takes precedence, and kind of things like that. So the idea of each change is tied to each particular um, option, which is tied to a sensor. Um, so you can kind of go into a variable on a system and see that, that history for that variable. So um, yeah, if, if, if there's a change that doesn't affect that, then it wouldn't show up there. Uh, and, and that gets a little bit hairy because if you end up deleting that variable from the database later, then that change history still needs to persist. So it, So each sensor can be in zero through n groups. Um, so you can make all the changes individually on each host, or uh, any particular cluster can be a member of as many groups as you want. Um, so that's one of the things I'm trying to figure out in kind of actually exposing this on the front end of what are, what settings do people want and what are the kind of configurations that I think my expectation would be um, basically the last change has the precedence. So if I, um, you know, set something on an individual host and then I go and I set some, that same variable on all my hosts, that later change is going to have a preference. But um, I, I'm curious to hear what options people want exposed uh, in that level of granularity, I guess. Yeah. Um, 3.0 and later. Um, and the, the I, I was hoping to get 2.6 support, but um, there are some fundamental things like the support for creating patterns dynamically and um, that, that just weren't there, and then the connection to, it's possible you could maybe get it working with 2.6 as well, with a little bit of legwork. But... Yeah, so part of the um, concept of having uh, that broker D shim Python process is that broker communication often needs to be, in the, the broker libraries often need to be in lockstep, that there are some changes between 2.6 and 3.0. Um, so kind of having that distributed model lets you have a broker D process that matches, the, that speaks broker in the same way that your, your Z cluster does. And actually when you go to install that, um, it'll use the um, broker Python bindings that uh, are installed with bro control and Z control. So it automatically picks that up and the, those should match uh, for you. And yeah, on the back end, things are version agnostic and you can see the version. It doesn't quite expose some of the limitations of the, oh, well, 2.6 doesn't support setting this dynamically yet. But yep. Vlad, thank you so much for your talk. All right.